thanks to everyone in the audience who is joining. Um, if you look at the chat, Lauren has shared a link to download the report that the presentation that we'll be giving today is based off of. We have a lot of information to get through, but um, amazingly, that report has even more information and detail in it as well. Just to kind of give, oh, and I guess I should intro myself. Um, I mean, I guess if you were watching the main stage today, my name is Scott Latchett. I lead the research and strategy team at PSFK. And I am joined by my colleague, Lauren Lyons, who is instrumental in putting all of these reports together. Um, we have been busy at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, um, putting all this work together. This particular report was produced in partnership with Avalara, who um, has spoken on the main stage today. And we're excited to share some of the insights from that particular report. Just to kind of give for, for folks who haven't been um, sort of joining us for the previous sessions over the last couple of days. The work that we do at PSFK, ultimately we go out into the marketplace and look for emerging signals of change, all related to a specific brief. Obviously in this case, we were looking to understand what was happening within the context of marketplaces. A very interesting subject and what I, I think more interesting from I, I, I will speak for Lauren and myself. I think we were not expecting this to be quite as interesting a topic as as it was and, and obviously very complex. But um, the approach with this particular report was to understand both how a seller could succeed within this within a marketplace landscape and then also thinking about the, uh, from a marketplace perspective, some of the things that um, either if you're an existing marketplace or if you're considering building a, a new marketplace, some of the things that you should consider to ultimately, um, you know, attract sellers and create a sort of best in class experience. Um, but as mentioned, we got into the marketplace, we research and look to see where innovation is beginning to take shape, these we shape up into trends, and that essentially becomes a framework for us to have a conversation and create a narrative about the things that um, we think folks from brands, folks from retailers should be considering within, the, within the, the larger context. And so today we'll share a snapshot of some of the insights within the context of the report. As mentioned, um, a lot more great insights um, that can't make it into this in today's presentation. But we also have interviews with um, with George and one of his colleagues at Avalara. I have an inter or we have an interview with Sharon G, who spoke on our main stage today. Um, one from a marketplace called Mav Farm um, that's doing some really interesting things, and then also um, a conversation with. Chloe Fisher from Bright Pearl, who they are another solution provider that's doing some interesting things in terms of that sort of back end experience for um, you know folks that are looking to sort of sell through marketplaces and in, in e-commerce in general. And really it's it it is kind of a fine line as we think about the nuances that separate marketplaces from from e-commerce. And in general, and a lot of those best practices kind of apply across the board, but we're going to be doing our best to kind of keep that conversation centered around what folks should be thinking about within marketplaces specifically. All right, lots of blabbing on, but let's go ahead and get started here. One of the things that we like to do in all of our reports is provide a little bit of context at the beginning to sort of showcase either um, how consumer attitudes or expectations are changing as well as how the industry is reacting. So, um, you know, this was something that that Ram mentioned in the context of context of his conversation today, that marketplaces increasingly are something that are that are, is where people are starting in many cases, their search and um, are taking a bigger piece of that sort of customer journey, if you will. 
So if we look at this statistic, 53% of U.S. adults said they begin their product searches on Amazon. Huge. Um, you know, in my conversation with Sharon, we talked about just the necessity of having a marketplace strategy, if only to be defensive in the way that you're sort of thinking about your say your your sort of broader omni-channel strategy. Um, and then obviously within the context of you know search engines more broadly, um, you know, that's less than half in terms of how people are using search engines like Google and Bing, but um, begins to sort of showcase the how search engine optimization across all of these different sort of uh, platforms is, is extremely important. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to see that, um, you know, if, if consumers are, are discovering a product on a marketplace, you know, almost half are actually going to visit that brand's website to make, um, you know, purchases later on. So there is, so, you know, even if that initial purchase happens on a marketplace, there's, there's still the, the possibility that you can sort of, garner that sort of longer term uh, relationship with a consumer as well. Um, mar particularly within marketplaces, we see customer reviews being a huge um, aspect of the way people are influenced to make their um, purchasing decisions. You know, some big numbers here, 90% of millennials, 84% 84, 84 of Gen Xers and 74 77% of baby boomers uh, are influenced by customer reviews. In some ways, it's the sort of natural progression from um, what, what we see in terms of your sort of personal recommendation that you might get from a friend or a family member. Obviously, social is a big part of this as well. And so, um, you know, how that, that plays a role within um, the broader commerce marketplace as well. Um, and then, you know, trust is trust and authenticity are a huge part of this as well. So thinking about um, having, um, you know, reviews that are honest, um, information that's accurate, all these things are extremely important. And, and again, when you're in a marketplace and there's multiple brands and sellers that you're competing with, um, you know, all these little things really contribute to that that bigger experience and the opportunity to, to sell as well. Um, personalization throughout the um, throughout the shopping journey is is extremely important. Marketplaces are something are, are do that do that well, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have native capabilities. Um, if you're if you're just starting out in e-commerce to do that through your own sites, but certainly that's important as well. Um, you know, bit, Amazon obviously has been a leader for a long time now in terms of delivering on that personalization. People like you have also bought this. Um, and so also important to sort of bring up how you sort of how your product fits into that broader um uh, SEO and, and how it shows up in some of these results. So that does get recommended as well. 58% um, of U.S. adults um, selected digital shopping platforms such as Amazon um, in terms of um, how, when they're sort of willing, in their willingness to sort of share um, data to get a personalized experience. Um, and then 36% of consumers consider a company's ability to provide relevant recommendations, um, something that's important and in terms of that sort of basic uh, shopping experience as well. And then, you know, sort of flipping this a little bit to looking at how um, brands or marketplaces or retailers are sort of thinking about um, the, the, the sort of marketplace as a, as a component of the sales strategy. Um, you know, it, we have here, um, uh, you know, this note, people want to monetize their audiences without expect, e expending more capital and holding more inventory. Marketplaces are a good way to do this. We obviously see um, the challenges and the costs associated with what um, the, the cost of addition, uh, the, the cost of acquiring customers through social media is getting more and more 
competitive and costly. So, um, you know, marketplaces are a great way to get those those eyeballs as well. Um, and, you know, I think this is this is, again, a, a, a component of a broader strategy that um, that companies need to have. And then finally, um, you know, one of the things that is both a challenge and an opportunity here within the context of the marketplace space is um, how you're sort of garnering data and analytics about what people are doing, um, either how they're interacting with your own products or more largely within the, the sort of marketplace itself. Um, and just sort of seeing that companies are beginning to double down on data and customer insights. We have a quote here from um, the VP and chief brand officer at Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, and, you know, consumers, again, sort of pointing to the fact that, you know, they're willing to, to share behavioral data that's going to trans translate into um, a more economical and convenient shopping experience. So, you know, this is, this is not, this is just kind of snapshot of some of the things that we thought were important as we approach this. With a lot of information to get through, I tried to do that quicker, but then I, but I don't think I succeeded so much. Um, but I can't wait for Lauren to talk soon. Um, just to give you a sense of how this report is laid out, we kind of approach this from six kind of big pillars of what we felt were important considerations within the marketplace experience, um, SEO discovery and research, the product page experience itself, um, the importance of sort of checkout and the payments experience, merchandising and fulfillment, um, back end operations, with, which kind of stitch this all together, particularly as you're thinking about um, how you manage product across multiple uh, channels. And then finally, the, the analytics and reporting part of this. And so within each of these sections, we have a couple trends that we're going to talk about and then ultimately um, share some highlights of examples that we think bring this to life as much as possible, keeping that squarely within the marketplace uh, sort of space as well. So as mentioned, um, you know, that front end of the experience, how people are sort of finding your brands um, and in what ways they're going about doing so. We, um, we talk about this notion of integrated search, um, which is, ultimately sort of thinking about the role that content plays within the broader sort of online sphere and how companies are um, utilizing new tools to move natural customers naturally from that um, sort of initial way that they're coming across a brand or a product and then um, turning that into a shoppable experience or um, at least helping consumers sort of naturally move down that funnel. So there's a lot of research out there that consumers are increasingly shopping online more, but there's also research out there saying, you know, consumers who are shopping online more since the big pandemic are planning to do so and continue doing so um, in the future. And so to engage consumers at that research and discovery stage, sellers really need to be looking at how they can position their advertisements and marketing efforts within those channels from, you know, every social channel that consumers are using today to search engines as well now. and those are um, something of interest for us as well. So here we're looking at Google Shopping. So they've recently revamped their mobile shopping experience by improving its location-based product searches. And I think that um, Sharon touched on this earlier today, but this really just allows shoppers to locate items at specific stores in their local area. And having that um, like near me product availability is a really big deal right now, especially for customers who, you know, maybe want to do a whole online shopping or maybe they do want to go in store, but they're not sure if they can get there. Um, so there's a little crossover here between just marketplace smarts and then also just online shopping in general. But by searching for a product and clicking the nearby feature within Google Shopping, shoppers can see this real time view of inventory in stock at local retailers. And then they're also given, you know, a map view showing the store's opening hours um, and other features right now include, you know, product comparisons, price tracking alerts. So a lot of different updates there that we find really smart. 
And so takeaways here for sellers would be, you know, understand best practices with each within each of the marketplaces, um, whether mass or niche um, that they want to be on regarding discoverability and SEO product research practices. And make sure that you're kind of like taking the time to align those on a one to one market base marketplace basis. And then also just another takeaway here, um, looking to continuously, you know, evolve that search and discovery strategy so that you can continue to, you know, align with specific um, requirements, but also, you know, keep up with consumers and where they are. Yeah. And I think, I think this is really interesting for a number of reasons that you've um, illuminated here, Lauren, I, you know, it's, it, and, and again, I, you mentioned the conversation with Sharon. I think what's arguable is, you know, what is a marketplace nowadays? Um, you know, there's so many ways of, you know, I, I guess in some ways it is anything where your product is sort of show, showing up that's not native to your brand in some ways. And so this idea of, of Google shopping and, and what it's sort of offering in terms of that real time inventory look is so critical. And then, you know, if we look more broadly at just sort of inventory as a function of, of a foundational aspect of retail today, that sort of availability is so huge, whether, you know, and especially if you're utilizing multiple channels, understanding what's available from a business perspective in order to make sure that if multiple people are trying to buy through various channels, that that's all available and accessible. And then from a consumer perspective, especially if, you know, we, again, sort of turn the attention a little bit and think about, um, you know, real world availability, um, you know, that sort of near me purchase intent is is so huge and such a big thing to capitalize on. So, you know, again, I think a lot of the lessons that we're going to talk about today are applicable, you know, are, are good things for retail in general, but then certainly as we think about marketplaces as well. We know that recommendations is a big part of the, the sort of you know, any commerce experience, um, you know, specifically as we think about e-commerce as well, there's a lot of different and interesting ways that that plays a role. I think the personalization and, and sort of curation and relevance that e-commerce can offer customers is, is really interesting and important. And, you know, especially as we think about e-commerce or marketplaces in general, one of the challenges is that you know, from a consumer point of view, all this choice is amazing, but it also creates its own um, sense of friction as well. How do I choose between all these various sort of um, products and styles that are available available to me? What's the best one? And so um, leaning in from a merchant perspective or a marketplace perspective into helping consumers sort of um, narrow down that set of choices is is really important and um, you know something that I think we we see being a bigger um, you know almost like a, a necessity in terms of um, e-commerce moving forward yeah and a marketplace that's really moving ahead with this concept is app-based uh, shopping platform the s uh, which creates tailor-made experiences for users through machine learning capabilities and we were actually lucky enough to have uh, julie who's the founder of the yes speak on monday and so if you want to check out her video once it's up on our youtube channel she can definitely offer a much more detailed overview and insights here, but the Yes app uses algorithms to create each user's style and shopping preferences. And it does this based on simple yes or no answers to fashion related questions. So results are based on replies and the Yes items go directly into a curated personal feed in the app. And so items that appear within a user's feed will, will depend on what their answers are um, and also what they're looking at, what they're buying. Um, and then also personal preferences, you know, sizing brands they prefer, what they've bought in the past. Um, and a cool feature here is just um, users are able to see similar shop, um, similar things that shoppers are liking, um, as well as like their friends' um, carts and whatnot to see what they're buying. And so for sellers, 
working with marketplaces that offer this level of personalization, there's an opportunity there to really offer like an upsell, cross-sell, related sell opportunity um, by leveraging those consumer profiles and preferences, um, and even just recent searches. And then um, really similarly, no matter what marketplace you're on, it's worth considering partnering with uh, a business analytics vendor here to ensure that you have this targeted messaging um, and can really kind of automate that process of taking uh, this broad data, but making sure that consumers receive the right type of marketing based on how they interact with your brand or how they interact with that marketplace. Yeah, all, all super great points. I, I love, um the sort of notion of, you know, it's, it's, it's um, important or critical to take um, information that you have about your customer and figure out how to make the, um, the experience more relevant to them. And it, whether that's something that you're doing sort of natively within your own site, or again, sort of thinking about how that shows up in terms of, the way that you're marketing to a consumer within the context of a marketplace, all these things super important. And then I love the idea from a marketplace experience perspective and what the yes is trying to do is sort of create this homepage experience that's super relevant and sort of puts that discovery piece front and center for consumers anytime they're shopping there. Obviously, uh, Amazon tries to do this, but perhaps a little less eloquently, um, so, or elegantly, I should say. Um, and, but, but we see this being, you know, really important, especially, you know, if, if sometimes people are on uh, a mission when they're shopping. I think perhaps maybe that's how people approach e-commerce often, but, um, you know, if you can, if you can capitalize on some of those discovery opportunities as well, I think that's a big, big win. Okay. And then obviously, you know, this I think is, is very important for, uh, from a marketplace perspective, but how your product sort of shows up in the, in that uh, marketplace is, is hugely important. And, um, you know, there's there's so many similar, you know, especially if you're more of a commoditized brand, there's so many similar products that are, um, you know, sitting within the context of marketplace. And so how do you stand out and sort of do something different as well? Um, so one of the things we, we want to touch on here is use of rich media. Um, there's so many new opportunities here. We've seen the explosion of video over, um, you know, the past several years. Obviously, if you get you know, a little bit more leading edge, we start to see AR and VR sort of start to play a role. But, you know, even things like, um, you know, just great use of traditional imagery and well shot imagery is hugely important. And, you know, something that's going to gonna set yourself apart from, you know, the other folks who are selling on, on a marketplace as well. Yeah, and so here we're highlighting this partnership between um, Springboat and Matcha. So through its acquisition of Matcha, um, which is a first like all-in-one blogging uh, capability for e-commerce brands, and so this automated marketing platform, Springbot, is supporting D2C brands' um, di digital storytelling efforts. And so Matcha's blog creator and content anal analytics combine with Springbot's email, social ads, and SMS marketing channels. So together they're like able to provide sellers with a communication platform where they can access blogging tools and e-commerce templates. Um, but they're also having sellers uh, or providing sellers with this ability to easily embed products within content and um, segment content by, content by audiences, identify what type of content is winning with what type of audience. Um, and so basically being able to optimize that for a greater product experience. And so main takeaway here within like this rich media creation trend is uh, really tailoring your product page content to each sales channel. So whether it's a marketplace or a website or a social platform, you know, understanding what consumers 
are looking for, appreciate, or expect on a different type of platform. Um, and there's making sure, you know, like you have the right type of content there, whether like Scott said, that's an AR tool, a 3D view, video content, or just great imagery. Yeah, I think more and more we're seeing that marketplaces are sort of embracing this ability for brands or sellers in, in the um, that are utilizing their platform to use more of these tools and you know really kind of play around with what's what's possible. And then again, like I think that oftentimes the examples that we choose to showcase within the context of these reports touch on a lot of um, you know multiple things that we're that we're sort of seeing. So the inclusion of analytics here that helps you know with this particular tool to understand what's actually working and then give you the ability to kind of customize and, and sort of refine, I think is is really important. This notion of community activation, again, I think is, you know, if we think about it more broadly from an e-commerce marketplace, how you utilize your community to sort of amplify what it is that you're doing from a you know, brand perspective or what it is that you're selling. You know, on the first day, we, we talked to Ron John Roy from, um, gosh, I'm gonna forget, uh, Adore Me, um, who was talking about their ambassador program and how the company is sort of looking to cultivate advocates within its existing consumer base. But then, you know, on a more sort of simplistic basis, how you're encouraging your customers to come back and, and leave reviews or, um, you know, engaging them after the fact to um, provide feedback about their experience. Um, and then all the way through to, you know, some of these more sophisticated or, or higher ask off sort of offerings like, sharing through social media or creating user generated content around that. And then how you kind of translate that back into your product page experience or the way you're, you're sort of selling to new consumers. Yeah. And so here we're really interested in this idea or concept of how you can offer consumers this opportunity to interact with your brand beyond a typical listing through this interactive content. Um, and so the example here we wanted to call out on Singles Day this past November, which if you're not familiar with Singles Day, it's similar to Prime Day here in the US, but um, it's bigger and central to the Asian market. But on Singles Day, Coach launched this virtual version of their New York City, mar um, their New York City flagship on Tmall Luxury Pavilion. So this is Alibaba's e-commerce marketplace, but it's built specifically for luxury and premium brands. So within this virtual store, shoppers were able to earn redeemable points as they completed tasks. So that ranged from just checking in um, to the store, sharing the brand's um, singles day campaign versus like via their own social channels, and then also through joining the brand's um, or coach's membership program. And so this kind of gamified shopping experience all happened on this marketplace, um, ended up driving over 100,000 new memberships for coach. And so this all ties into this idea of immersive visualization for the consumer, right? But main idea that I like here is this example of how Coach was able to create a really immersive experience within a marketplace. And then also how they were able to really encourage, encourage and reward customers based on their level of engagement. So that's that's what stands out for me here. Yeah, I think those are all I think those are all great points. And again, you know, I mean, we do see this happening in various ways. Um, across the sort of retail marketplace, encouraging um, consumers to engage and then providing some level of reward or perk um, in order for doing so. And then, you know, specifically as we think about sort of social engagement and sharing that has huge benefits for the brand that can sort of amplify what, what they're doing um, on, a, on a larger scale. Certainly, within the context of any commerce experience, that sort of checkout and payments experience is extremely important. Um, you know, as we worked with our partner Avalara on putting this together, that's um, you know something that they specifically are um, interested in calling out and and have you know really been smart about how they've how they've talked to us and and made sure that this is something that you know we're sort of queuing in on and. You know, I think 
from our point of view, we approach this from a couple different um, factors and, and thinking about the channels and, and, and the way consumers are going to interact with that content. And then again, as you sort of expand what you do as a brand how, or a seller, how you begin to automate some of the, these sort of um, complicated processes that um, you, would, you would otherwise have to sort of navigate on an individualized basis. So mobile optimization, mobile is becoming a bigger piece of um, that sort of e-commerce um, interaction and in the way people shop today. This consideration is hugely important just in terms of, um, you know, how you're thinking about um, what that mobile offering looks like, how it sort of um, moves and changes across um, devices and the way people shop. Um, and then obviously um, utilizing some of the native tools that are specific to uh, mobile and, um, you know, making that sort of checkout process um, as easy as possible um, within that context. Yeah, and so we know consumers expect checkout to be frictionless, fast and secure. Um, and so we touched on this example on Monday's um, Next Gen Digital Commerce presentation, but because WhatsApp is able to connect shoppers with so many businesses at once, we like it for marketplaces as well. And so WhatsApp, if you're not familiar, is a secure mobile messaging app. Um, and it's one example of how retailers and brands are building on this um, idea of you know mobile optimization, right? and eliminating time intensive processes for consumers um, is through its add to cart feature now that uh, came out pretty recently. And so shoppers are able to order items within a single text, text message from multiple participating businesses all at once. So the updated feature works with the WhatsApp's existing product catalog from all of its listed businesses um, and users can browse multiple listings, add them to their cart, receive recommendations, and then actually check out within a single message. So WhatsApp users are able to both, you know, search on their own, message businesses directly, browse any products, and then complete their purchase. And so right here, I think the main takeaway for a seller looking at a marketplace is just realizing the opportunity and building customer loyalty. Um, by aligning with those marketplaces that provide, you know, instant, accurate, upfront cost, um, a reliable checkout experience, um, and really support easy checkout as well. And I know another note from um, Megan Higgins from Avalara, she mentioned how checkout is like the crown jewel of the retail experience. And I like thinking of it like that way because that we talk about everything that leads to getting someone to check out, but if checkout is an awful experience, you're really going to lose that customer. So it's definitely a step in the customer journey that deserves attention. Yeah, and I, I, I love to see the sort of expansion again, you know, of how all of these various platforms now are, are starting to bring commerce natively into their experiences. We've talked about chat for a number of years now. It's the primary means that we as consumers are sort of interacting with one another on a regular basis. And, you know, we've seen these behaviors in the Chinese market through apps like WeChat, where, you know, suddenly there are these sort of super platforms that enable not only communication, but commerce and all these different sort of things that are happening. And so I think it's natural to start to see this begin to happen within the U.S. market and Western Europe, et cetera, and how brands are starting to take advantage of that. And then obviously bringing in checkout and transactional elements into this, especially with mobile where, you know, you kind of have this, you know, a lot of us now have um, various sort of native um Inform payment information sort of as a part of the way we're using mobile and then just sort of tapping into that and making that, you know, integrating that into these experiences is, is really interesting and important. Compliance becomes, you know, it's, it's not something that generally speaking is on PSFK radar, but I think as we understand how this plays a role, particularly within the common context of businesses that are scaling different um, states have different tax compliance um, issues. When you talk about things on a global scale, then you start to consider um, things like customs and 
sort of crossing borders and all these different things that become very complex. Um, if not done properly, then um, not only does that impact the business, but that can you know sort of adversely affect the customer experience as well. So thinking about um, the importance and how that comes to life um, in a marketplace context. Yeah, and so kind of to highlight or outline how compliance comes into play when you're looking at a marketplace and a seller, uh, we wanted to call out this partnership between Zillow and Avalara. So um, in case you don't know, online real estate marketplace Zillow, as it was growing from just a startup to you know a nationwide offering here in the US, uh, its exposure to task risk, or task risk did as well. So in order to process, manage tax compl um, complexity, as well as compliance across its marketplace, Zillow partnered with Avalara, which provides this all-in-one software solution backend compliance team. And so by integrating a few different tools from Avalara, so one of them is the AvaTax tax product, which dynamically delivers sales tax um, calculations based on, you know, latest rules, rates in the, like all are found within their own tax engine, because these are something that we've learned are changing constantly and you really have to stay on top of, or you can get into a lot of trouble. So um, they're automatically applying those tax rates and um, charges to a shopper's shopping cart. Um, and then also they, or Zill Group is also using, um, oh no, that's the only thing, sorry. So. This was a great way of how Zillow Group is maintaining that confidence um, for both people who are shopping with them, but also across their own internal systems um, to make sure that they are complying across its marketplace. And just a good example of how um, marketplaces are addressing sales tax, but um, I'll, let, I'll let Scott move on to the next one there. These ones are always like tripping me up with compliance. No, that's totally fine. We're, we don't, we didn't hire you to be an expert in tax compliance on top of everything that you do, Lauren. So um, totally, totally fair. Um, but needless to say, these are complex things and, you know, this is not something, you know, any business needs to be concerned with. And so, you know, one of, you know, one of the quotes that we um, pulled from our interview with um, Bright Pearl is that, um, you know, that, that sort of need to automate is, do you, do you remember the specific quote? Oh, yeah. So, um, it was like automate the boring or automate the back end so you can focus on that, like customer value or customer interaction. Yeah, so absolutely. And so yeah. I think, I think all these things are, are so, so important, but, um, you know, again, like, Focus on the things that you um, that you want to control and can control, and then you know think about how you automate some of these other things that um, you know are are less important to your day to day, but critical to your business sort of overall. Merchandising and fulfillment here, we sort of think about from the standpoint of um, how you're how you're sort of have enough inventory on hand, and then obviously. Um, the various ways that you can get that um, into the hands of the consumer. Obviously, there's so many other um, things beyond just these two trends that we're sort of touching on. But, um, you know, in the interest of sort of telling a broad story that sort of hinted at some of the perhaps more innovative things that are happening in the space, we chose to sort of highlight um, two things that we're seeing. And, and I think, you know, these come to life in some of the conversations that we've been having over the course of the, the four days of, of this conference as well. Um, on, on Monday, we talked to um, Philip Raub from Model Number no. 5, who is um, leading in the space of um, on-demand manufacturing for furniture. Um, obviously, in the context of the pandemic, one of the things that we saw was um, how you know disrupted the supply chain got and that limited the, the ability for um, product to be available for consumers, particularly things that were in, um, you know, specific need. And so um, thinking about production from an on-demand point of view has a lot of different advantages. Um, it can um, limit some of this sort of ability of holding inventory and the, the costs associated with that. Um, you know, ultimately, if things don't sell, then there's a cost to the business that 
then leads to a reduction of cost um, in terms of sell selling that item. Um, it creates opportunities for customization as well, which I think is quite interesting. And then um, certainly there's environmental sort of um, benefits a, a part of this as well. Yeah, and so while this is a growing consideration, you know, on-demand manufacturing is tricky. So, you know, few brands and retails have that re real-time supply chain inventory visibility. Um, but having that visibility as well as having insight into your own supply chain, but also like demand levels is really essential to ensuring product availability, which is important across marketplaces. So um, a good example of how this comes to life from us was when considering, you know, how to support its factory workers uh, early on in the pandemic, small batch organic cotton label, The Wild, decided to offer this pre-order based event. And they partnered with Sustainable Online Marketplace, Rev Invert, and so this is more of a niche marketplace rather than a huge one, obviously. Um, but they were able to host the reserve only collection. So items were made to order, shipped directly to cons uh, customers from Bali, where the Wilds factories are located. And just to manage, you know, customer expectations around this before placing orders, the Wild um, informed every customer, you know, it's a handmade process to create each piece. It'll take two to three weeks for production it should ship to you within six weeks. So they really made everyone be aware of that timeline. Um, and so just, you know, applying this on-demand model, sellers have this opportunity, like Scott said, you know, optimize production costs, limit excess inventory, um, and then also, you know, generate consumer engagement. You reduce excess inventory, but you have this product buy-in and are able to really highlight those customers who are interested in your brand. Yeah, and I think this is, I think this is really interesting from the standpoint of, you know, again, maybe limited releases. Um, we've talked about the product drop model on various sort of occasions here at PSOK, and we love that as an opportunity to sort of garner a lot of excitement around um, limited, limited edition or exclusives. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of great storytelling that can be done around this as well. And something that I think is, um, you, you know, in this particular instance, um, you know, the, br the brands have considered as a, as a holistic part of what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, that, that sort of anticipation and sort of setting those, um, the, the sort of guidelines ahead of time so customers know what to expect, I think is, is, is really important here as well. And I think the, the, the final thing I'll say is that, you know, this doesn't have to be something that you do for every single product, but I think there's a, you know, especially if we think in niche or specific products, you can learn a lot about your consumers and, and their willingness. And then perhaps um, based on the success of this, then moving forward, um, you know, knowing that what your, um, you know, what the, the sort of um, limitations are or, or how much you can scale these releases is, is really important as well. Drop shipping is something that's quite quite interesting for us, um, you know, especially because it reduces a number of the costs associated with um, shipping products multiple times in order to get it to um, a warehouse that then it, where it might sit and then go ultimately get to the customer. This is this is sort of shrinking that um, that uh, time or um, sort of um, the, the distance that products need to travel from warehouse or from manufacturing to warehouse to get to customer. Um, and it's it's beginning to be seen as a sort of competitive advantage, particularly within the digital commerce space as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, it creates an opportunity is to um, enable you know, where the right partners are concerned um, to really sort of control what that um, experience looks like from a packaging to a to an unboxing experience as well. So I think there's, um, you know, when done right, this this can really be an extension of, um, you know, how that brand sort of touches the customer. Yeah, and so here we're highlighting drop, drop shipping application um, of Ber Oberlo 
I want to make sure I'm saying that right, which is a free app on the e-commerce platform Shopify. And so Oberlo offers businesses a free plan, and this provides them with access to, you know, up to 500 products that Oberlo handles for them, um, unlimited monthly orders, and a host of educational tools. So to help, you know, sellers kind of on board to this drop shipping process, they can access, you know, drop shipping e-courses, e-books, and other guides tailored to, you know, the drop shipping newcomer. Um, so there's an educational element that they provide their new customers with. And then along with this free plan, you know, businesses can, can upgrade um, and that upgrade opens them up to be able to access, you know, 30,000 products, bulk orders. So if they're really trying to drop ship a lot at a short amount of time, um, as well as offers real time tracking, which is important too. Um, so we know with this too, to call out, increasingly there's this demand put on sellers by marketplaces to ship, if not fulfill orders within that like 24 hour uh, window to really meet customer expectations now. And so partnerships with these third party providers who can automate that process is really important for sellers who are looking to scale. And then also here, just another way to kind of inspire greater consumer confidence and trust by ensuring that convenience, um, both on return policies as well and operations overall. Yeah, this is one of the fascinating sort of parts about the marketplace process that I was maybe not as aware of initially. I mean, when I was initially setting up drop shipping um, in the presentation just a few minutes ago, you know, I was thinking about this from a brand perspective. And in this case, um, Oberlo is sort of existing as if you just want to start selling product, they're ultimately just giving you the ability to sort of like choose from a number of sort of existing partners and then kind of get going. So in that case, you're not necessarily a brand, you're just really um, operating as a seller and then obviously using all the, the great tools and things that we talk about in this report to figure out how best to, um, you know, get the eyeballs and get the sales. And so it becomes a, you know, it's a numbers game in that case. It's really, I, and this is, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in this space as well, where you're not sort of like, you know, going through and building a brand and, you know, selling product that way, but you're just like, tapping into what's already exists in the mar in, in the marketplace um, and then going out and selling it to an audience. So it's pretty fascinating to see that. And then obviously, you know, this, this wouldn't have existed without partners like this that provide that sort of back end sort of warehousing and drop shipping kind of capability. So, um, you know, really, really interesting as a, you know, if anyone's looking to just totally change their career and sort of <laughs> wild wild west space um anyways um you know as we mentioned uh a lot of this particular as we're thinking about selling across multiple channels again whether this is owned whether this is marketplaces whether this is through social whatever the case might be um having the sort of solutions to to sort of help with that process hugely important some of the things that that we think are critical to that are managing your your sort of pricing. You know, hate to say it, but pricing still is a critical component of how people are choosing to shop today. And so, you know, being able to sort of understand what similar products are being sold for on various channels and sort of updating your pricing um, in real time to sort of compensate with that. Um, you know, in an e-commerce context we're starting to see the, the sort of early days of thinking about personalized pricing um, for various consumers as well. Um, and then ultimately, um, you know, how you kind of um, have a one, a, a one click view into everything that's happening across your channels and the tools to sort of manage that um, in, in various ways. So again, I just talked about the pricing thing. Let's um, take a look at how this kind of manifests um in some of the examples that we have here cool so yeah so looking at how you know an ai powered really price optimization solution can really calculate millions of values for you um, and automatically adapt as demand shifts so we're, here we're looking at online marketplace the list which provides customers with instant access to one-of-a-kind um, products and 
also features a dynamic pricing based um, on demand, right? So items for sale debut each day at 9.30 a.m. New York time at market price. And then they are either marked up or down depending on demand as they stay available. So looking ahead, the list plans to use its data to provide brands and retailers uh, that are listed on its platform with this real-time access to consumer behavior trends and help them be in this position to make better informed, you know, more sustainable buying decisions based on what is selling, how, when, at what price point. So here we're interested in how sellers through, you know, third party or marketplace partnerships can optimize collected data and algorithms this way in order to consistently provide consumers with the best price um, while also you know remaining competitive against similarly listed products because you know consumers will jump around they will try and find the best price it's an easy search for them so just knowing like and resting assured that you are offering the best price at every every possible moment yeah i mean this is this is really critical the the sort of ability to again you know if you if we think about a a platform like amazon it can often be uh a race to the bottom in terms of how people are sort of pricing their things and um you know every plat every marketplace is different in terms of how they handle what appears um where and search and you know it can get quite complex i love the ability here for then you know this again to be a place to experiment and test from a brand perspective and you know there this doesn't have to be again a, your full strategy but a, a component a, a cog as a as a part of a broader one um and then gaining some of those analytics and then using that um a, across what it where and how you're you're selling as a as a customer you know again we talked i talked about this at the beginning but um you know this sort of ability to see what's happening in real time across um, you know the various places that you're selling um, and and the ways that various solution providers help give you that insight and the ability to kind of manage things across various channels in an easy way yeah and so here we're interested in that idea of um, accuracy of inventory across you know all websites all marketplaces all channels that you can be found on and so china's largest online retailer jd.com uh they're in the process of partnering with like more than 200 luxury brands including those like Prada, Miu Miu, um, and they're providing them with their own omni-channel solutions so this is offering them you know synchronizing online and offline inventory um, helping them to incorporate their latest campaigns onto their product pages. So a lot of different services that they're providing. But so luxury brands who partner with JD on this are able to use their collected consumer data. So brand partners are able to gain better understanding of their shopper. They're able to provide those same shoppers with recommendations that align with them, um, all thanks to JD.com's algorithms. And so Additionally, JD.com will be able to help um, each of those brands design and customize their own stores, providing these brands with greater control over that online experience. Um, but here are the main call out for sellers that we wanna take away is when building your marketplace strategy, um, just understanding how product data for each of your listings is being continuously updated for accuracy across all marketplace locations and really considering how tools or vendors that automate that process can be leveraged to provide you with greater convenience, but also to make sure that, you know, customer satisfaction is always top notch. So that's why this one's ex exciting to me. Yeah. And I think to your point, you know, so much of that, you know, as, as mentioned earlier on in the presentation, inventory is critical to this. If you're selling through multiple um, channels and you have a limited amount of inventory, it can really be like a, you know, a, a by the second or by the minute kind of game in terms of what's available. So having the sophisticated back end in order to ensure that when people are clicking by that the product is actually available, um, you know, because as we've seen, Delivering a great experience is an expectation uh, or having a great experience is an expectation for consumers. Um, they're not wowed by that typically, but um, anytime this experience sort of falls down, then that, um, you know, creates um, an opportunity for them to sort of go to a different retailer or brand, sort of, um, you know, make a purchase. And so there's, there's much more tension in getting it right than, um, you know, and, and the, the 
challenges of a bad experience are, um, you know, are seen sort of instantaneously. <clears throat> and then um, the, the final section that we want to highlight today is um, around this idea of, of analytics and reporting, how you ultimately um, derive data from um, the platform that you're selling through, and then the various ways that that can be used more broadly within the way that you're um, connecting with, with consumers and, and sort of using that to be smarter as a seller moving forward. And so, um, you know, this first idea, you know, we've hinted at this in, in various um, sort of um, aspects today, but, um, you know, thinking about how you um, are understanding how consumers are either um, buying their product, buying your product, how they're interacting um, with your, with you in a digital context. And again, that could be on a marketplace, that can be through social media, that can be um, on your own own site, um, but then ultimately sort of constantly refining what it is that you're doing as an organization um, to respond to these changes in, in, in real time. And, you know, in an earlier example, we, we showed how this could manifest in terms of, um, you know, marketing, but there's so many different ways this can kind of play out in a broader marketplace uh, context. Yeah, so we know like any marketplace engagement has a cost as far as time, energy, you have to create specific teams to support those marketplace sales. So it is important to be, you know, regularly regularly evaluating your performance and return on each channel or marketplace and then also be able to adjust your strategy accordingly and hopefully in real time if possible. So um, example here from Shopify, rather than using its aggregated data for its own benefit, at least for now, Shopify is helping its community of sellers uh, to really continuously refine their traffic and advertising strategies. So if Shopify, you know, notices that a merchant's traffic is coming through um, or being driven through Pinterest way more than it had been, you know, they'll ping them, suggest or advise, you know, maybe you should activate your Pinterest for Shopify channel, you know, or more heavily push product through that channel. Similarly, if Shopify sees, you know, Instagram is converting really well as a source, they may instead encourage merchant to buy more ads on Instagram um, for greater return on their investment. So, and you know, just another example here would be um, Walmart's content quality dashboard, which they launched recently and put a lot of work into um, the listing quality. And with that, you know, Walmart, Walmart Marketplace is providing their sellers with access to, to how their items are performing and also providing them with recommendations on how to better optimize it for Walmart specifically. So main thing here too is just while marketplaces can offer wealth of information via data, um, sellers really need to focus on reviewing what could be most actionable and what they can you know, run with the quickest. And so here, this is a great example of how you can quickly pivot to you know, see the biggest returns. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Lauren, that um, you know, all, these, all these marketplaces and all these solutions provide slightly different sort of insights and, and views um, and, and handle what's available and what's accessible accessible in different ways. And so, um, you know, that kind of goes back to one of the things that um, I discussed with George earlier today is, you know, really, and, and I think Sharon sort of mentioned this as well, is you, know, you really need to understand, um, you know, what makes sense from your, you know, sort of brand perspective or your seller perspective, where you should be selling. Um, and then understand the sort of unique attributes of each of those platforms and, and what they offer, who that audience is, who your competition is, et cetera. Um, and then uh, again, another way that we're seeing sort of data being leveraged is, um, you know, turning those insights into um, something that informs uh, R and D, if, if, if you will, or the innovation process. Um, so that can be, um, translated into new services or new products that ultimately are sort of tapping into unmet needs um, from your your larger audience as well. Yeah, and so here we're looking at European e-commerce company Zalando and to improve or continuously improve on its customer experience, they chose to 
um, partner with Amazon Web Services Cloud Solution to op um, basically optimize all of their business functions, um, spanning supply chain management, pricing, marketing, customer care, so the whole gambit. But by employing Amazon SageMaker, um, they were able to build, train, deploy machine learning models quickly. And then through what's called Amazon EMR, they're able to actually capture, store, and an analyze all of those masses of data. So Zalanda's um, engineering teams were then able to take all of that and all of those insights and use it to create, you know, based on customer purchase data and whatnot, create these personalized shopping features like fit avatars and product recommendations and size recommendations, as well as pre uh, predict a customer's future outfit preferences. So by partnering with Amazon Web Services, they were able to really create this personalized, curated experience for each of their customers on their website. So there's this level of you know, continuous learning, continuous testing, and then building on innovations to you know, continue to elevate that customer experience. Yeah, and I think this is this is just a thing that has you know sort of holds true for all retail and all sort of you know frankly all good businesses, you know not settling um, on one strategy that sort of you know continues um, all the way through. It's just constantly constantly adjusting and iterating and refining what it is that you're doing based on the things that you're you're learning. Um, and, and again, having access to that data is a critical sort of component of that. So that was a lot of great information that we have gone through. As mentioned, um, you know, there are additional examples. There are um, many, many more insights within the context of that report. Um, some great quotes from a number of experts who we interviewed as a part of this, but we just wanted to leave off with um, some sort of takeaways that hopefully have kind of run through um, the, 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 the presentation today and, and throughout that report um, is, you know, if, as, you know, consumers are increasingly using marketplaces as a sort of beginning part of that, that sort of product search experience um, in, in how you sort of optimize um, that as a part of your, your omni-channel strategy in terms of um, garnering data about, um, you know, who, who that audience is and then ultimately, um, you know, how you optimize that sort of SEO experience. And again, as like how you might show up on an individual marketplace or how you use that to sort of drive, um, drive discoverability uh, into your own channels as well. Um, using, um, you know, no matter what channel, um, consumers are, are sort of finding your brand, um, you have to build trust and authenticity within the context of that. There's a level of consistency that needs to happen, um, re regardless of how many channels you're sort of selling through, how you show up in each of those, um, is, is extremely important. Um, again, to not only capture that sale in that channel, but then thinking about sort of building that broader relationship you have with customers. Um, trust and, and confidence are extremely important and um, being accurate in terms of um, how you're optimizing that checkout experience is hugely important. Um, fulfillment is a huge part of the, the sort of any sales strategy today. Um, and as we probably saw over the the holiday um, the holiday um, holidays this year, sorry, I couldn't think of that that word. So I just um, the holiday season. You got there. Um, I'm still waiting on a present that's been promised for me. Um, so you know, really thinking about what how fulfillment sort of plays a role in your bigger experience is um, you know hugely important. Um, you know, anytime you're selling on more than one channel, the way that you are sort of connecting all of your operations together, even if you're sort of starting out, hugely critical um, in terms of delivering a great customer experience. Um, and then, um, you know, ultimately how you continue to sort of um, watch what's happening um, in the marketplaces that you're selling through, how other competitors are utilizing those spaces and continually adjust your strategy in accordance with that, I think is 
um, you know, a, a final thing that we'll kind of leave, leave off with. Please download the report. Um, I don't know if anyone from Avalara is um, actively tuning in, but um, we want to thank them for being a great partner and helping us put this together. And then, um, you know, appreciate everyone who has joined us um, either today or throughout the four days for participating in Retail Innovation Week. week. Um, there will be lots of great content that will be shared um, on our YouTube channel. So if you miss anything, um, you can access that all um, there as well. So thanks, everyone. Really appreciate you uh, tuning in today.